The conventional wisdom was the Iraqis were so angry about the Romela oil field that they were going to take the Kuwaiti part of the field. So they were going to go into Kuwait. We thought maybe five, maybe 10 kilometers because the rest is just wasteland and just secure the field. Are you thinking to yourself, holding two thoughts at the same time going, really bad guy, do we have to get involved with this though? No, and I'll tell you why. That's a good question. Really bad guy, we need to push him out of Kuwait, Mm. which was the original plan. Right. Nobody ever used the term nation building, right? That was that was the one dirty word nobody could utter because it was none of our business to start building nations. And, and we're not and good at it. We're not good at it. We, we, I mean, post-World War II, we can't point to a single success story, really. Um, like, really, not a single one. Well, kind of Germany and Japan. Post-World extent. War II. Post-World War II. Yeah. But oh, I mean, oh, you're counting I mean, that as... Yeah, I'm okay, counting that it, because it. of the aftermath of World War II. Yeah, 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 that's really our only success story. Yes. So, um, you know, and, and let me add something too about the, the cause of the war. It was clear in the early summer of 1990. Actually, let me ask you, do you mind pulling up a map of the Rumela oil field, R-U-M-A-I-L-A-H, Rumela oil field? So this is an oil field that's like 95% under Iraq and 5% under Kuwait. Got it. So which one do you want, John? Um, Yeah, that that first one looks like it. Right there. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Now you see, you see the the green. It sort of ends at the Kuwaiti border. Yes. It goes across the Kuwaiti border like a kilometer, and the Kuwaitis were slant drilling. They were drilling diagonally under Iraqi territory oh. so they could steal the oil and the Iraqis caught them. Right. Not good. So the Iraqis said, you're stealing the oil. We're going to send troops to the border. And the Kuwaitis are like, oh my God, they're starting to freak out. So the Pentagon asked the U.S. defense attache in Baghdad, do us a favor, drive down to the border and tell us if there's anything we should be worried about. He drives down the border and he says, the entire Iraqi military is on its way south. How big was their military? Oh, it was, it was about 200,000 people. Oh, it was big. That'll do. It was the fourth, fourth largest military in the Middle East or third. It was big. It was big. Like Iran and Egypt were bigger, but it was big. So he's like, we need to take this deadly seriously. So... The State Department, under Secretary of State James Baker, sent a cable to the U.S. ambassador to to Iraq, April Glaspie. I loved April. She was a career diplomat, just an awesome person. She lived with her mom in Baghdad. Her mom was old and needed, you know, elder care. So she, she was living in Baghdad with her daughter. They were getting ready to go on vacation four days before the invasion. And so Baker sent a cable saying, before you go on vacation, go see Saddam Hussein. And she had only seen Saddam once. It was when she presented her credentials. So it was, uh, Saddam didn't meet with anybody, really. It's so strange, like thinking of it now, like Saddam meeting with like a US official person. Mm -hmm. Uh Uh-huh. Crazy, right? Yeah. So April goes to see Saddam and she told Saddam exactly what she was instructed to tell Saddam, right? Now, I remember the talking points cable that went out. And the point we wanted to convey was that the United States does not take a position on Arab-Arab border disputes, right? Oh, wow, that's not what I was expecting. That was a critical mistake. Okay. The conventional wisdom was the Iraqis were so angry about the Romela oil field that they were gonna take the Kuwaiti part of the field. So they were going to go into Kuwait. We thought maybe five, maybe 10 kilometers because the rest is just wasteland and just secure the field. Nobody thought they're going to take the entire country and then it's going to fall in four hours, right? The whole country fell in four hours. Saddam would never. I know. Well, we figured because the the Iran war, Iran-Iraq war had just finished like 18 months earlier, like he really wants to start another war. But Iran's such a formidable mm-hmm. 
big cunt. Like, there's mm-hmm. a lot there. Whereas Kuwait, you know, that was is the key. Little... That was the key. And in his mind, the American ambassador had just said, "Go ahead and take Kuwait. <laughs> We're not going to interfere." <laughs> right. I mean, thinking about it though, like just looking at this as a third party outsider observing. I mean, sending 200,000 people to the border seems excessive. Taking the entire country definitely seems excessive. Mm-hmm. But seeing as they did drill into his country, yeah. some sort of action actually does. Absolutely right? right. Absolutely right. And if he had just taken the Romela oil field. Y'all would have said, okay. That would be Iraqi today and Saddam Hussein or one of his kids would be the president of Iraq. Yeah. That'd be a very different world. Yeah, you bet it would be. Okay. So he invades the whole country though. Now mm-hmm. what happens? Oh my God. I'll add one kind of funny thing. There's a, a monument, a, a memorial maybe is a better way to say it, in Kuwait City for one of the royal family members. He was, he was like the fifth or sixth brother of the emir at the time. And his name escapes me now. Fahad, mm. Sheikh Fahad Asabah. Uh, there, there are two versions of the story. There's the official version, and then there's the true version. So it's August. It's so hot that when you step outside, your hair is in danger of combusting, right? That's how hot it is. So 80% of Kuwaitis are out of the country. They're vacationing. The poor ones are skiing in Lebanon. Everybody else is in the States or in France or the UK. This royal family member stayed in Kuwait. The official thing is the Iraqis cross the border he realizes what's happening. He grabs a gun. He goes outside. He starts firing and the Iraqis fire back and he's martyred. <laughs> and so his Lincoln town car, they gold plated his entire Lincoln town car. There's a giant golden fist coming out of the roof of the car and the bullet holes are still in the car from where the Iraqis shot him. The truth is he was drunk <laughs> He was passed out on the couch at his girlfriend's house. She woke him up and said, I think the Iraqis are invading. (laughs) He goes out there drunk, like, who shot who in the what now? And they shot him. Listen, John, you cannot let the truth get in the way of a good story. That's right. You should know this. That's right. So this freaking gold-plated Lincoln, like a 1988 Lincoln, it's enormous. It's in a traffic island right on the Corniche with this giant golden fist coming out of it. And that's that symbolizes the royal family's courageous uh, – they all ran for their lives was the truth. But yeah. this is their courageous stand against the Iraqis. But we went in and it was like the shortest war ever. It was like, what, three days? You know, like there, yeah. No, uh, yeah. Five it was days? Very, very short. Yeah. Uh, there's something very important that I learned in that conflict um, that I, I've fallen back on all these years. Um It is to determine whether or not a war is actually going to happen. Always watch the deployment of ships. It's always about the ships. Uh, The conventional wisdom at the time was that the Persian Gulf was too shallow to accommodate an aircraft carrier. So we had never sent an aircraft carrier into the Gulf. It's also, we believed, too narrow at the Straits of Hormuz to get in Each carrier has 12 ships that go with it. It's called a carrier battle group, okay? Um, By the time the bullets started flying, we had six carrier battle groups in the Gulf. We had more in the Arabian Sea, the Red Sea, and the Mediterranean. Mm. Like we we brought every every aircraft carrier we had in the world uh, to just bombard the Iraqis. And then what ended up doing it really, I mean, this this was visionary leadership by by General Norman Schwarzkopf. He was the commander of CENTCOM. Right. Um, it, it was a very simple and very elementary, like first year plebe flanking move. It was as simple as that. So the Iraqis had utterly fortified the Kuwaiti-Saudi border. So we sent a couple tanks and they fought in what became known as the Battle of Khafji. It was actually just a diversion we didn't really intend to uh, to fight at Khafji. What we did is we sent most everybody else around into Saudi Arabia, up and around into Iraq, and we struck the Iraqis from the north. They never expected it. Mm. 
Thank you for watching the video, guys. If you haven't already subscribed, please smash that subscribe button and check out this clip's full podcast episode by clicking here or in the description below.